Good afternoon, and welcome to our live webcast of Open Book, Open Mind Online with Ann Patchett. She's talking about her longtime New York Times bestseller, The Dutch House. I'm Ariel Zeitlin, Montclair's programming librarian, and here are a few housekeeping details. My colleague Molly is going to turn on her share screen to show the image of the control panels. So uh, whether you're using a phone, a tablet, or a computer, you have the same controls in GoToWebinar. Here's the question mark or chat box, which is your link to me and to uh, my librarian co-host, Molly Hone, during the webcast. You can use it to get live tech help from Molly, and you'll also use it to send us your questions for the author Q&A at the end. Thank you, Molly. Now I'd like to introduce Gina Chung Fort, who's a member of the board of our foundation. Gina, welcome. Hello. So pleased that you're all here for our webcast of Open Book, Open Mind in 2021. I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the foundation. The foundation is a group of your friends and neighbors and our mission is to raise funds that help make possible many of the offerings that make our library so special. This includes library programs like the one you are attending today, staff development, building restoration projects, and other critical needs that exceed municipal funding. Donations that support everything from laptop lending and Wi-Fi hotspots for Montclair residents without internet access, delivery of materials to seniors who are at home, the children's summer reading program, and most recently, the significant growth in e-content in the pandemic. In these unprecedented times, the Montclair Public Library remains a constant, thanks to the support of nurse donors like you. Unfortunately, this year, the library has seen a large decrease in anticipated revenues, over half a million dollars, resulting in staff cuts, elimination of weekend hours, closure of Bellevue branch, and impacting many of the services our patrons have come to depend. If you'd like to continue to see your library flourish and enjoy programs just like Open Book, Open Mind, please consider making a donation through our website, MontclairPLS. Dot org. A gift of any size will have an impact. Support is needed now more than ever. Thank you very much for attending and now please enjoy the program. Okay. Um, I just want to thank Gina so much for all that she does and for everybody on the foundation board. And also um, for all of you in the audience, if you're looking for another way to support the library, please consider joining the Montclair Library Friends. They're a group of passionate, dedicated library users who advocate on behalf of the library, and they're looking for new members to help continue their efforts to maintain library funding. If you'd like to join or learn more about their efforts, please visit our website for more information or search Montclair Library Friends on Facebook. Finally, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Anne Patchett. Hi, Anne. Hi. Wait, here I am. There I am. Hi. We're so excited that you're here. I'm so glad to be here because I'm here, but I'm also in my house, in my office with my dog. <laughs> um, well, in addition to her most recent book, The Dutch House, Anne is the author of seven novels, including the New York Times bestsellers, Bel Canto, State of Wonder, and Commonwealth. She's also published three outstanding works of fiction, of nonfiction rather. Anne has been the recipient of numerous honors, awards, and fellowships, including the Penn Faulkner Award and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Her writing has been translated into more than, more than 30 languages. Anne is uh, living in Nashville, Tennessee with her husband and her dog, Sparky, who I have a feeling may make an appearance. Hello, Sparky. Welcome. It's all downhill from here, folks. You've seen Sparky. That's it. Go home now. Okay. 
Ed is also the co-owner of a greatly loved independent bookstore, Parnassus Books, in Nashville. We at the library consider Anne a woman after our own hearts because in addition to writing so many wonderful books, she's a vocal public advocate for bookstores, libraries, and reading everywhere. And apparently all of you agree because more than 500 people signed up for this webcast, which is our highest turnout yet. Um, Anne's novel, has, uh, the, the Dutch House, has just been released in paperback. So here it is in all its paperback glory. It is available to purchase from our partner, Watch on Booksellers in Montclair, and also to borrow from the library. Um, the book has garnered rave reviews, won numerous awards, and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Um, as the reviewer from NPR wrote, Patchett's concern here, as in much of her fiction, is with the often unconventional families we cobble together with what's available to us. Being Patchett, she brings her novel around to themes of gratitude, compassion, and forgiveness. Chances are you won't want to put down this engrossing, warm-hearted book even after you've read the last page. Now, I'm happy to introduce Alice's conversation partner, Jean Cummins. Hi, Jean. Hi. Hi. Um, Jean, um, I'm sorry, I said your name wrong. It's Janine Cummins, excuse me. Um, okay. Janine, New York Times bestselling author in her own right. She is the author of American Dirt, two other novels, and a memoir, R.I.P. A Rip in Heaven. Welcome, Janine. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Okay, so this is the moment we've all been waiting for, and I'll be back to read the questions for our audience Q&A. And for all of you at home, please remember that you can start submitting your questions while the conversation is going on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Anne. Thanks. Hi, Janine. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Things are crazy in the world. Um, Things are crazy in the world. Yeah. It's really nice to see you and Sparky. And it's, and can I just say to I, all of you at home, this fabulous painting hanging over my head of Sparky, Janine just had that done for me. And it arrived only days ago, which will cue you off to the fact that we are actually real life friends, not just two anonymous New York Times bestselling authors thrown <laughs> together to have a conversation. Yes, Sparky looks so aristocratic there hanging on your wall. It makes me really I, happy. I think he looks Byronic. <laughs> that too, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just want to start by saying that, um, you know, it feels a little, the world is really crazy and intense right now, and it feels a little strange to sort of, you know, indulge in a pleasant afternoon talking about a yeah. novel, given what's happened in Nashville and the nation over the last few weeks, but I don't think an event of an event like this as indulgent really. It it feels to me like it can be a master seminar in compassion, because Anne Patchett writes the kind of novels that I believe are part of the antidote to this cultural moment. You know, when the world feels really overrun by hatred, novels that function to deepen our understanding and compassion for other people do the work of actively creating more empathy in a world where we desperately need more empathy. I, you know, I believe that good novels encourage us to closely examine people we might otherwise be tempted to write off. And in this climate, I think we need a lot more of that. So even more than um, typical novels, I think, The Dutch House, which I really loved, um, and I listened to oh. on, on audiobook with another master of compassion, Tom Hanks. Yeah. Uh, it feels like a, almost like a sneaky treatise on compassion because um, the characters who have it and the characters who don't, I mean, very clearly don't. It seems to me that the presence or absence of that compassion in their lives dictates so much of their happiness and what happens to them. So, Thank you for writing this beautiful novel and thank you for giving me the opportunity to come here today and talk to you about it. Oh, um, I mean, thank you for doing this. I spend so much of my life 
interviewing other people because I am a bookstore owner and um, and I hate asking people to interview me because I know how much time it takes up and that it's a lot of work. And so I just really appreciate you doing this. Thank you for not making me be alone here today with only Sparky to guide me oh, as a conversational I, partner. I would argue that Sparky is probably a really great conversational partner, but <laughs> really happy to be here. So I would like to start by taking a sort of back door, if you'll pardon the pun, into the Dutch house, um, because oh, I recently yeah. also read your brilliant essay collection, This is the Story of a Happy Marriage. And it gave me so much insight and envy into your writing process. Um, so I wanna start just by talking about this essay, The Getaway Car, which you wrote for the Byliner in 2011. I found it really fascinating to hear that you tend to compose your novels largely in your head ahead of time. And so, and first, I want to know if you can teach me how to do that because it seems yes. really efficient. Um, <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then I want to know, how, like, how does that work? You know, did is that how you wrote the Dutch House? Did you sort of see the whole thing in your mind first? Well, um, yes and no. I mean, that's definitely how I write. And like right now, I am working on a novel that is I haven't written a word of. But I do just kind of sit and stare out the window and think, but then what do they do? And it's progressed. I've been thinking about this book for a little over a year, maybe a year and a half. What do they do? Where do they go? Who's in the room? Well, then what would happen? And the last thing I always figure out is the, and the hardest thing for me to figure out is the narrative structure. Who tells the story? I mm -hmm. wrote The Dutch House in first person, and it was the first time I had written a first person book since like 1994, I think, when I wrote Taft. That was my last first person novel. And I really enjoyed it. And I thought, okay, the next book I write is going to be in first person. And now I'm not so sure about that. So those are the, the final things who tells the story and what's the narrative strain, structure and frame. Um, but with the Dutch house, I did figure it out in advance, but I made a huge mistake and I wrote the whole book and I threw it out and I started again, which my friend Elizabeth McCracken, I said this to her recently and she said, yeah, that's called a second draft, um, which is so funny because it was like all this time I was thinking, and then heroically I threw the whole book out and she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The rest of us do that eight times. But I never have done that before. So when I wrote The Dutch House that you read, um, I, I didn't know what was going to happen at the end. I didn't have it as mapped out because the first time I wrote it, there were an entirely different, it was an entirely different plot. It was the same people, the same house, the same time frame, um, but a really different set of circumstances that bombed completely. That's fascinating. So that was actually on my list of questions when we were talking about this subject was like, do you ever have to throw a novel out or, you know, because that happens to me all the time. So it's somewhat comforting to hear really? that. Yes, like, I wrote. Have you written the whole book and thrown it out? Yes. The American Dirt, I wrote two versions of that book, wholesale, entire books that I threw in the garbage wholesale. And the third one was the one that eventually became a book and how um, close by the way i love american dirt how close uh was the third version with the first two versions completely different uh not even the same characters there was one mm -hmm. one character who was the same and you know i was trying to write a book that was set in the borderlands initially i didn't want to write a book that was set in mexico i was really nervous about that so i was I had a whole different cast of characters and everyone who read the book would say, I don't care about any of these people except Luca. And oh, wow. so I had to write, eventually I wrote his book, you know? Um, but I love the idea that you can do all this work in your head ahead of time. And, you know, and so I'm curious about how it works with the different elements of craft, because it sounds like you have a lot of the, the characters fleshed out. I can see 
how that would work and even certain plot points. Um, but then there's that sort of magical alchemy that happens when you translate whatever it is you're envisioning out of your head sure. and onto the paper and everything changes, right? Right. So like if, if I sat down right now and I wrote down every single thing that I knew about this book that I've been thinking about for a year or a year and a half, it would be one page. You yeah, know, that's amazing. So I always say it's like taking a long car trip. So if I'm driving to see you and I'm going to leave on Thursday and I know it's a two day drive. And so I know I, you know, I'm gonna, I can drive eight hours comfortably in a day and I know where I'm going to, I don't, I don't know where I'm going to sleep. I don't know where I'm going to stop to eat. I don't know when I'll, I was going to say get gas, but I have an electric car. So I don't know where I will stop and recharge my car. Um, I don't know what I'll order in the restaurant, you know, but it's just like, I know where I'm going. I know the road I'm going to take. I know when I'm going to leave and I know approximately when I'm going to arrive. But I don't know anything that's going to happen in that time on the trip. But if I don't know where I'm going, I don't get anywhere. I just, then I just sort of drive around in circles. I have wow. to have a destination. I have to have some end point in mind. I, I like that. That seems like a thing that I could use. I'm just picking your, I'm going to steal that. Because sure, why not? Well, you know, the thing is, everybody everybody does this so differently. I was listening to Alan Alda's podcast the other day, Clear and Vivid, which is one of the few podcasts I listen to. And he was argue, he was um, interviewing, I was say arguing with Margaret Atwood. That was a weird slip. He was interviewing Margaret Atwood. And they were talking about the fact that she only has one piece of advice that is applicable to every single writer. You want to hear it? Because yes. it's really good. You have to figure out your posture right now. Because if you write with <laughs> poor posture, if you write in a bad ergonomic situation, then it will catch up with you and destroy you. Uh, and she was like, that is the only thing that is true for every single person who writes. I'm uh, Kevin Wilson is a really, really dear friend of mine. He wrote Nothing to See Here and The Family Fang. And he told me not too long ago that he writes, <laughs> he writes in bed, lying on one side with his head propped up on his hand and typing with one hand. And I was like, if you don't stop this this week, you're going to be cold <laughs> and you're never, ever going to be able to write anything else. You know, your whole spine is going to. Yeah, it can't be good. I, I mean, I, I'm not trying to be judgy, but that doesn't seem <laughs> conducive to writing more books. <laughs> and, you know, it's really funny because the older I get, the more, I mean, the more and more and more practical writing becomes and the more and more it is a job. And the more I do want to say to young writers, the most important thing is good posture and making sure you have health insurance. Um, because if you really want to write for your life and you want it to be a job, it is so much less about inspiration and talent and creativity and so much more about sitting. Yes, it's and doing the work. That's true. I mean, it is true. I have a friend who, um, who says that every time she writes a new novel, she has to learn how to write a novel all over again. And it's this like painful... And I tragically, I think I agree with her. It's like I haven't, I've learned nothing by writing these four books. Like I have to start all over because every book is so different and presents a unique set of challenges. Um, but one thing that always strikes me when I listen to you talk about writing is how, how dedicated you are to your craft and how that's always been true for you. Like it's never, it was never a question. And I just, I admire that so much. I, I don't know where you got that, that. I don't know either. I don't know. I mean, it, that was just like, that was my gift from the cosmos. That was, that was my great good luck. You know, it's like, whatever, you know, the, the great attribute I was born with. I knew what I wanted to do and I got to do it. But I want to say every time I write a book, 
I feel like I've learned nothing and I feel like I'm starting over again, except for the fact that I know what my own markers are. Like I know I never feel good about what I'm doing until I get to page 80. Oh. And, and so when I'm page one to page 80, which I'm incredibly slow at the start, like it could take me a year, no joke, to write the first 40 pages of a book. I am so slow to start and I throw it away again and again and again and again and I hate it and it's a terrible idea. But I always think, oh, well, you know, this is you. You're on page 60 and you're not going to feel okay about this until you get to page 80. Oh, you know, now you're on page 120. You know, that's where you really have the dark night of the soul. So I, I just repeat my own patterns and that in fact makes it easier like i've never in my life missed a deadline so whenever i'm doing a piece of journalism or i have an assignment and i think there is no way i am not going to get this done and then i think but you always say that you always feel that way and you always get it done so just let that go yeah that's great i do think that i have the same I don't write in a linear fashion. So do you write from page one to page 400 just yeah. in that order? That's amazing too. I do. Um, because my markers are quite different because I don't write in, in that way, that same way. But I have learned, that is the one thing I think I've learned as well is not to freak out because I, I've learned how to forgive myself for the days where I don't produce a single word, but I know that I spent four hours researching or thinking of, about something that will inform the work in some way so now, that's very is simple. it true is it true for you because it is definitely true for me if i have a horrible day well uh, two things one the day in which writing is horrible and labored and i write six sentences and the day that the writing is smooth and effortless and i write six pages and then i write six paragraphs it does not make any difference in the quality of the work so when I put it together, the days which were tortured and labored and the days which were effortless and smooth are exactly the same. But also the days where I sit at my desk for eight hours, I delete every single thing I write. I feel like a total idiot. The next day, I almost always have a good day. It's like I'm laying the groundwork for a good yes. day. I think that. I think that's also true for me. And I also find that often when I have a really bad day, I just can't see where I went wrong. And if I give it a little space, the next day I come back, I can identify the miscue and rip it out. And then it's I'm off to the races after that. It just, yeah. sometimes I need that little gap, you know? Um, and a lot so of times you always know. No, go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask if you, you know, if you envisioned this book largely ahead of time, did you always know it would be called the Dutch house? Did you know that the house would be such a big character in this book? Um, I originally, and by originally, I mean all the way until I was finished, I wanted to call the book Maeve. Oh. Okay. Then. Did she come to, was she your first? arrival in this novel no but she but the book was just about her in my mind it's so her story um mm -hmm. and then i wanted to call the book uh mave or the dutch house because there's a graham green novel that i love called dr fisher of geneva or the bomb party and i just oh. love that title it's really super obscure graham green so Maeve or the Dutch house. But here's the thing. I own a bookstore. And again, because I've been doing this for so long, I could just see the whole conversation playing out where my editor would have been like, well, you know, we do like that title. But I was like, why don't I just spare everybody a lot of pain and give them the title that they want? because yeah. so much of it has to do with the fact that there are the same number of letters in the word Dutch and house, and that I can see it, you know, how the letters are gonna line up on the cover. And yeah. the fact, then it swings the focus to the house, 
but that's why I really wanted to have that portrait of Maeve on the cover of the book to bring the yeah. focus back to her. But you really are a pragmatic writer when I hear you talk about titles and how it's going to look on the on the cover. That was very kind of you to do that for your editor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you just at some at a certain point you know. And and the Dutch house is a great title. It's very clear, it's very memorable. Yes. Certainly there were there were people who wrote me notes telling me how much they loved the French house or the Swedish house or all the different ways in which people get titles wrong. Every that's always my marker like everybody gets titles wrong. I wrote a book called Run and I thought you know three letters nobody's yeah. going to have trouble with this. And I got all of this mail saying, you know, how much they enjoyed ran or how much they enjoyed gone or walked or, you know, there's there's no avoiding it. But the Dutch house, except for getting the country wrong, people more or less got it, and held on to it. Yeah, that's funny. Um, I think I, I'm trying to skip through my notes here because I think you and I could talk for many hours and and probably we should just get on the phone when this yeah. is done and yes, we could we do that um but i'm not gonna we're not gonna get through everything i have written down here and i want to make sure people have a chance to ask their questions so i'm gonna fast forward through some of what i had, had and i'm just scrolling here okay um, can i say something about you while you scroll you scroll yeah. and read uh, okay. Because I think that this is a great story. Um, one of the many things that, that's been so wonderful about being the co-owner of Parnassus Books is all of the great writers that I've gotten to meet and adventures that we've had. And so I, I read American Dirt. Uh, I had a galley of the book that my publicist had sent to me and she said, this is the book of the year. This is just the best thing I've ever read. And she sent me her galley and I took it on a flight to England and I read the whole thing, never went to sleep, was so riveted. And I called your publisher and asked if I could blurb the book. Like they didn't ask me for a blurb. I sort of just elbowed my way onto the cover of your book. And, and we picked it for our first editions club and you came to Nashville and it was a wonderful event, but you know, a disastrous, absolutely disastrous night. And you were going to leave town and you couldn't leave town. And my, uh, I never carry a cell phone, but I was so worried about you that I carried, I put a cell phone in my purse um, and my husband, isn't this right? My husband called me or and said and said Janine's coming yeah. over <laughs> and you came to my house yeah, and then we sat up been... and we ate ice cream and cried and and we, you know like bonded forever uh, and it's for all of the misery that you endured um it was so lucky for me and and our friendship has just been such a great joy and sometimes the things that are born of really, really crappy moments in life can be uh, very, very deep. So that's all. That's how we know each other, folks. Thank now, what question that. did um, you find? What did you find in the scroll? Well, you know, it's actually a good segue because um, I want to ask you about, this is like I'm really jumping around here, but I, you know, when I was reading your essays, there were so many, I had so many moments. I love, loved your, no, I love your novels. Um, and I've had, you know, those moments in your novels too, but there were so many moments when I was reading your essays where I felt like a light went on in my brain and I learned something about myself by reading, you know, one line that you, you know that you wrote about your father or something like that and i just those moments of sort of crystalline those epiphany kind of moments i think that's why so many people read and why you know in in large part why many people write as well and um so the not the essays also really speak to me i love your nonfiction, and so i <clears throat> i'm going to ask you about an essay that you wrote 12 years ago 
and much has changed in our culture over the last 12 years, but I found this given the sort of protracted moment of painful culture, cultural reckoning that's happening in this country and that I was um, very much in the middle of earlier this year. Um, the essay is how to read a Christmas story. And mm -hmm. there was, in the end, you're just, you're describing a moment of your childhood when you're, you read a story that your father sent you and which had a big impact on you. And what you, I'm going to read the line. You said, <clears throat> all the while, I understood it was fiction. I knew the narrator was a made up person. The author very likely had never been to an orphanage before. I understood this not because there was anything shoddy about the work, but because I was concentrating very hard on what it meant to write at that time in my life. Writers need not be confined by their own dull lives and petty Christmas sadness. They could cut new stories out of whole cloth, stories that did not reflect their own experiences, but spoke instead to the depth of their emotions. And <clears throat> I loved that and I found it for obvious reasons, very comforting to read at this yeah. moment in my life. But then, you know, in thinking about it, the fact that you, re you wrote that 12 years ago and you've also lived through this cultural reckoning, I wonder if it's had any impact on the way you think about writing fiction moving forward, if, if anything has changed for you. It's such an interesting question, and certainly our friendship figures into my thinking. And what I what I think, boy, guys, those of you who really love Bel Canto, not a book, I, not a not a book culturally that I should have written, or should be writing, or could write now. I think that if I had the idea for Bel Canto now, I would think, well, I'm going to pass on that. But that's also true of Taft and Run and certainly State of Wonder. I mean, those are all books in which I am, uh, I am doing exactly what, what you were publicly eviscerated for doing. I just, I just had the good sense to do it a few years before you, uh, before, before the great cultural shift, but I, I have been doing the exact same thing. And it is something I think about a lot because we do want to be, we do want to be sensitive and we do want to stop and say, just because I have been doing this, should I, should I continue to do this? Um, I have, I have a lot of uh, black characters in my fiction and sometimes from a first person perspective, and to me, it's always been so important to reach outside of yourself and to write about people and experiences that have not been your, your own experiences, because I do think of writing as being primarily an empathetic act. Um, and at the same time, I want to say, that, you know, there's, I get the balance and I get the other side. Of, of people saying, you know, leave my experience alone, stick to your own experience. I think that the, from my, to my mind, the answer is, if you want to play, you have to be prepared to pay the price. And that means that I am, of course, entitled, I mean, really, like, by law, that I am allowed to imagine whatever I want to imagine. No one can put a fence and say, you know, you can imagine up to this point, but not past that point. But the price that I'm gonna have to pay, and you're gonna have to pay for going past that point, is that um, people will feel entitled to eviscerate you um, on NPR, the front page of the New York Times, or or whatever. Um, and it's a, it, and and maybe we deserve it and maybe we don't but i think we have to be true to who we are creatively um you got so much grief but you also sat at the very top of the new york times list for a long time and i have a bookstore and i sold so many copies of your book to people who loved it and who had exactly the experience that you hope to have. You are creating empathy 
And they're coming back and saying, oh my God, I read this book. I have so much more empathy. I mean, what you hoped to achieve was exactly what you achieved. And, and in many cases, the same thing is true for me. Um, yeah. I, you know, so, I, I was, yeah. I, 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 I really appreciate you being so open about it. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. It's a tough question. No, not right at all. Yeah, but I think that so few people are having this conversation in meaningful ways. You know, it's happening where it's happening. It's happening in an echo chamber. Um, and it's often happening in a way that's so intense and vitriolic that 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 not much is actually being said. So I think it's a conversation that more writers really need to publicly engage in and and really grapple with out loud so that the readers too can understand what we're what we're up against as writers and um you know i don't know i don't know where we go from here i don't know what the the future looks like so it's um well, i'll tell you for me and we've talked about this before the future looks like never looking at social media because <laughs> it requires so much bravery to write and it requires a hell of a lot more bravery to write outside of your personal experience. I don't want to know what anyone has to say about it. They can talk about it all they want, but it is not my job to participate in the conversation. It's my job to write the book. It's my job to make the art. And if people want to love it or hate it or never buy it or discuss it, that's not my part of the job yeah how wonderful that you have that um you know that really clear core definition of your role in this endeavor especially given that you're also a very beloved independent bookseller um i have you know a history in sales and publishing as well and sometimes my i get very blurry in, in the lines of what's expected of me. So it's really, it's so comforting to be in your presence and <laughs> soak up your wisdom. But again, honestly. I think it's that, you know, I think it's that I just don't look. It's like, it's like I write op-eds for the New York Times. I never look at the reader's comments because if I did, I would never be able to write an op-ed ever again. And yeah. it's not like I quit. It's not like I was on social media and I stopped. I just yes. never, it's, I always say it's like I never picked up the crack pipe. And people will say to me all the time, oh, I want to be like you. I'm going to go off of social media. And I was like, no, that's like saying to a person who's never smoked crack, I'm going to be like you. I'm going to go off of crack. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's not a similar experience at all. It's very easy to be in my position because I don't look. And and if that's willful naivete, it's the only way I can make art. I like it. I think you're wise. You're very wise. Thank I thank think you. that we should invite some of the audience members now to probably get involved in this conversation. If Ariel, I think she's going to come back. And because we believe it or not, we've talked for over 40 minutes already. It feels like it was fine. And we could talk for another four hours. And when we get <laughs> off, we should get on the phone and do just that. Yes. And I was loving it. I felt like it just went by like this. Sometimes I get worried when I'm running these programs. I'm like, oh no, they're going to run over and there won't be any audience time. This time I was like, keep talking, keep talking. <laughs> we can. We, <laughs> I believe it. Okay. Uh, I do have a lot of questions. Okay. So Carol wants to know, where did you get the idea for the Dutch house? Was it the house? or the family who would live in the house? First. It was not the house. The house is just, the house is a really good, easy symbol of the outward face of a family and of prosperity. Um, it, it really, the idea for the Dutch house, the Dutch house, the original version of it was a book primary, primarily about Elna, the mother, and about the idea of someone so identifying with the poor and being so repulsed by wealth. Um, and this is right after the Second World War when the book begins, when there really was not an American middle class. 
and they go from being quite poor in a in a way where all of their friends are at the same level to so spectacularly wealthy that they are completely cut off from themselves and their own experiences and the mother couldn't bear it and it was about her journey away from that and the book was a bomb and then i wrote it again but that's how it started okay um so here's one that's just pure love i'm gonna share that with you for the fun of it robin <laughs> says amazing exclamation mark five exclamation mark thank yeah. you for seeing okay here's one that's a little more critical <laughs> To believe, well, that Elna hated her house, the Dutch house, and that her unhappiness leads to her leaving the family and the family unravels. Yet, it was Danny's dad who whisked Elna away out of a convent and should hold some responsibility for changing the course of Elna's life. Is that a fair point? Sure. Yeah. Because, you know, doesn't mean that it's going to happen. Um, all, <laughs> all sorts of people do things they should take responsibility for. I can think of a really great example from just this week. Uh, it doesn't mean that they do take responsibility for their actions. People somehow hold fictional characters to a much higher moral standard than they hold real people. Now, people are like, but but he's responsible. He should have done something about that. I was like, yeah, well, you know, people don't always take responsibility. Okay. Um, so uh, here's another one that is uh, Jocelyn, Sandy, Elna. This is from Joanne, by the way. Jocelyn, Sandy, Elna, Norma, and Bright, even Andrea. Uh, all of these characters are women, uh, are, are notable sing, single women, especially Maeve, right? Yet the, uh, a narrator is a married, oft clueless man. Does this reflect the author's view of our culture's male character as obtuse, out of touch with emotions and immature? Could the same novel be written with a female as the narrator and younger sibling? So when you write a book from the perspective of one person, you have a first person point of view, you only have access to what that person sees and what that person knows. So yeah, I mean, the book could have been written by someone else, but you have to also say, would that person be interested in telling the story? Maeve, way too private. Never would she be interested in sitting down and telling her own story. Danny, who is really oblivious and no that is not my view of men or of the world that is my view of danny this one specific character um and all of the women who surround him and lift him up who he doesn't really understand all that's being done for him it's just something fun to write about okay um so in fact i wondered that too because it's a sibling story and so I kind of wondered why it didn't go back and forth between the siblings. Um, yeah, life, life doesn't work that way. <laughs> it's not necessarily symmetrical. No, okay. it's not. So uh, Barbara would like to know, what are you working on currently? And you did say oh. that you're working on a few things. Yeah, um, and Janine, I meant to say this when you were saying such nice things about my essays. I, I appreciate that. Now more than ever, because I am finishing an essay book, or I have just finished an essay book and sent it in, um, and it's called These Precious Days, and it will come out the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. The title essay, These Precious Days, is the cover story of Harper's Magazine right now. It is the longest essay ever. It is the novella of essays. And um, you can go online to Harper's Magazine and read it. And that's what I'm doing. So all of, through this pandemic, when I've been home, I've been writing nonfiction and I've, I've found it really, really comforting. I've, I've been very glad to be writing nonfiction. All right. Um, okay, so Cynthia wants to know, I wondered about the Dutch house itself. Did you base it on an actual house? 
The descriptions were so vivid and made the house come alive in my imagination. Um, no, I didn't base it on an actual house um, because I wanted the descriptions to come alive in your imagination. <laughs> and uh, the Dutch house is whatever house the reader loves the most. If it's if it's your best friend's house or if it's a museum or if it's a house you grew up in. I had this experience back last December, December a year ago. Um, I, I wrote a profile of Reese Witherspoon for Vanity Fair. And um, after we had been together in the bookstore for a couple of hours, I went over to her house. And when I walked in the house, it, and we both live in Nashville, um, it just stopped my heart. I, it, it, there was something about that house. It was like the house of my dreams. Not, not like the house I wished I lived in right now, but somehow it was the house of my dreams. And I said it to her, I was like, I, what is it about this house? This is the most astonishing house. From the outside, it was just a pretty house, but inside it was amazing. And she said, when I was in high school, this was the house that the other girls lived in. And I, I thought, oh my God, that's exactly what it is. Because we didn't go to the same high school, but we both went to girls' high schools in Nashville. And that house that she made was the house that the other girls lived in. And that was exactly the feeling that flooded me when I walked into the house. This is the stuff of dreams. This is the stuff when you're in high school you wished you had. And I wanted somehow to get exactly that feeling even though I wrote the book before I went into Reese Witherspoon's house, you know, like this is the house that you dream about. Um, even though, you know, it brings nothing but misery, it's that kind of house. And I would venture to say it brings misery because everyone wants to live in it or they don't want to live in it or right. it creates, it has so much power. So Sherry wants to say, there are so many books I would love to read, but I recommend This is the Story of a Happy Marriage to everyone. And I also love The Magician's Assistant. Ah, you know, it's so funny. When I meet people who have read all my books, like if I'm on book tour and the, they're the diehard Ann Patchett fans who come up to the table, so often the book that they say, I've read all your books, I love your books, but it's Magician's Assistant. And I don't know why that really always makes me so happy. It's one of those, I, I always wish I could go back and write a book again. Like just take the, I not rewrite the book, but just say, I'm gonna take that plot. I'm just gonna write it again. A whole different story with different people, but that plot, that, that book has a great plot. All right, um, uh, here's another one. This one is from Tally. I read with delight your recent piece in the New Yorker, My Three Fathers, which I also loved, loved. Thank you. Uh, and uh, immediately thought of the mothers in some of your novels, specifically the Dutch House and Commonwealth. Without getting too nosy, do you find mothers harder to write about? Um, you know what? Yes, I think that mothers are harder to write about. And back in the days when I used to teach, that was something that we talked about a lot. I think one's father, to, this is a gross generalization, and everybody would say, well, that's not true in my family. Your father is a story <clears throat> because your father goes away and comes back at night, is going out into the world, and your mother's always there. And, and, I just think from for a lot of people, you can you can shape your father into a story where your mother is too close and too complicated and doesn't translate as well into into paper. Hmm. Hmm. Um, now, so sorry. So smart. It, yeah. Well, thanks. <laughs> I used to I used to give an assignment where I would say, you know, write a profile of either your mother or your father in X number of words. Tell me something about their life that didn't make it sound like an obituary. 
And the assignment was the fact that 99% of the time people wrote about their fathers. And then we would have a conversation about why do you write about your father and not your mother? Because your mother's not a story. Your mother is like something that is physically attached to you that you can't get the distance on. Hmm. Hmm. Everybody's going, hmm, yeah. Hmm. They're all thinking, what about my relationship with my mother? That's right. That's right. <laughs> Mine's different. I just got an invitation today to do an anthology piece. It's daughters writing about their mothers. And my 10-year-old said to me, it's okay, mommy. Just don't tell grandma about the book. <laughs> <laughs> so she already knows. She gets it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> She's not writing about you. That's right. <laughs> Yet, anyway. Yeah. Exactly. Um, well, for here's a change of pace. Um, just wanted to say that I appreciate the crown and paw dog portrait. We have the same outfit on our cat, Larry. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> it's a good shout out for crown and paw too. It is, it is. And um, do you want to show us, is Sparky still there? Oh, sure. We see Sparky. Aww. <laughs> see? Look how, look. Look how accurately he's been captured. Oh, good. He's like, why did you wake me up? Okay, go back to bed. <laughs> okay. So Zoom book tour is so much better than going out on the road and sleeping in hotels and getting on planes every day. Right, because you can bring your dog. Right. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so Barbara wants to know, what are you reading now? Oh, I'm reading Hamnet. I'm reading Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. And because I own a bookstore, I only read galleys. And, um, and, and I make all of these Instagram videos to sell books because that's what we do during the pandemic. Uh, although I've never seen them because I'm not on Instagram. And at the end of the year, I made a video of, and in which I held up the five books that I hadn't read in 2020 that I really felt so bad about missing because I'm always reading things that are, you know, way out in the future. And if I miss a book, it's, it's kind of like missing a salmon that swims past you on the stream. You're not going to go back and catch it. So I just finished reading a 600 page galley that I wound up really hating. And I won't tell you what it is. Uh, that's coming out this summer. And, uh, and I just thought, I want a reward. I want to read one book that I want to read. And I'm reading Hamnet. And it is, it's so good. It also is one of those books where suddenly all of my friends were saying, Hamnet, Hamnet. You know, that was my favorite book of the year, Hamnet. I loved Hamnet. And it, it's amazing. Janine? Yes, I loved it. I read it in Galley as well. I did an event with her in London last year. And... I just was blown away by it. I don't know where she got the courage to write this book, but it's she really went for it. And the reader benefits from her bravery. I mean, she, to, it's such a daunting subject. You know, she she imagines Shakespeare's wife and their life together. Um, and she does it in such a way that you're you're in it. You're there. Yeah. And I loved it. Yeah. You don't doubt her for a second. That's the amazing thing. What are you, Janine, what are you reading? I am reading, um, oh my God, I just finished your The Great Alone, Kristen Hanna. I can never remember the titles of books when people ask me what I'm reading. I'm also reading a galley that I don't remember the name of because it's on my Kobo. Um, so I can never remember the titles of books when I'm reading them electronically. Uh, but yeah, I'm just... I'm I'm mourning over having finished your your essays, which were really. I'll I'll send you uh, I'll send you the the book. Good, thank New you. New one. Yeah. Um. Okay, so Leslie would like to know. Uh, she wants to know more about the elements of your first draft of the Dutch House. How is it different from the final version? You know, I don't want to talk about it too much because the first draft gives too many spoilers for the Dutch House, but let it suffice to say that 150 pages of that book took place 
in Calcutta. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. Okay. okay. That just gives you some feeling about how bad it was. It was bad. <laughs> it's a very different book, you know? Um, so here's another one. Uh, this is a different Barbara. Did you view the house with its own personality? And if so, did you think of the house as you would a character? No, you know, the house... Everybody's so curious about the house because the book is called The Dutch House. But honestly, if the book had been called Maeve, I don't think that people would be quite as focused on the house. I, I mean, to me, it was just a fantastic house. And, and writing a fantastic house has got to be the easiest thing in the whole world because we all know in our hearts what a fantastic house looks like. There aren't many details about the house. There are weirdly few elements. And it was it was just such a snap. Because in my mind, I know people who have a blue and gold ceiling in their dining room, and I mocked it. And I have been in a house that had carved panels of birds in the powder room. And I have been in a house that has a ballroom on the third floor. And I have been in a house, this is a very big thing in the South, but especially in Nashville, a house with a glass front door and then a glass back door where you can see all the way through the house, which to me just seems like the greatest, most elegant thing in the world. So I could just sort of cherry pick all of those details. But no, I'll tell you what was hard, writing about the New York real estate market in the 70s. That was so hard. That was so hard for me to figure that out writing about a beautiful mansion outside of Philadelphia, frankly, anybody could have done that. Um, so I'll just ask you a quick follow-up then. What was so difficult about writing about the New York real estate scene in the, in the 70s? Because I couldn't figure out how someone could make a fortune if they had no money. How can a person with absolutely no cash make a fortune in the New York real estate market with no money. When there are houses, when there are burned out shells of brownstones in Harlem that are for sale for $1,200, which in fact is true, but you don't have $1,200, how do you solve that problem? And that was, that was a very tough thing for me to figure out. The medical stuff was very easy because my husband is a doctor and I made him the same, I made Danny <laughs> the same age as my husband. So I could just keep going to Carl and saying, okay, when do you get a cadaver? Okay, what did you do with your cadaver on the first day? What, how many people threw up in your class? Did you throw up next to the cadaver? Do you throw up outside? That's really easy. You'll always want to make your details to be parallel of the detail of somebody that you actually know, preferably a person in your own home. Great. <laughs> Great <laughs> advice. <laughs> okay, so this one is from Eva. She says, can you both talk about how you came up with the details of the book, each book, and when and how you de develop the personalities? That sounds like a tall order, but. Okay, well, since I've already talked about the carved bathroom panels. I'm going to throw this one to Janine. Oh, for me, it was research, research, research. You know, five years I spent traveling, you know, traveling to Mexico and visiting migrant shelters and orphanages and um, talking to everyone I could find who knew a lot more about the real conditions on the ground that migrants were facing than, than I did. Um, and then for me, it's not even so much about like sort of capturing all the details and writing them down. It's more, uh, I had to really sink myself into that environment for a long time and like stew in it so that then it sort of naturally infiltrates the writing, I think. Can I say something about that? That um, aforementioned nameless 600 page galley that I just finished? was a book in which the author had done so much research on so many different things, and she made us experience every 
single moment of her efforts. Nothing irritates me more. But when you do, I mean, that is really the, the mark of great writing. When you do that kind of research, five years of research, and you immerse yourself in another, another life, in another world, and then you internalize it, and you come out of it, and you don't have to prove it, right? You just write from the knowing and the, uh, the assurance of it, which is where your book comes from. Um, and you don't have to stick in every single thing that you learn and turn it into some gargantuan punishing bloat. <laughs> yeah, the dreaded info dump. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> um, this is, I think this is a really great question. This is from Krista. I really enjoyed the subversion of the prodigal son parable in the novel mm. and the book explores the prodigal mother. How did that use of the parable originate? And I guess, did you know you were doing that? Um, I knew I was doing it because I did it and <laughs> I'm Catholic. So I have those things at my fingertips, at my constant disposal. The, and, and I have to say the parable of the prodigal son is a parable that's really just always pissed me off because um, I'm, I'm not so big hearted. The idea that this kid just takes more than his share and burns all his bridges and does nothing to help the family and then comes back and the father celebrates. I mean, I, as I get older, I can, I can see the decency, but as a kid, as a kid in Catholic school, I always just thought that is so unfair to the brother that stuck it out and did all the work and never got a party for anything. Um, so those are, those are wonderful things to draw on. Okay, so Krista, you were right. Um, <laughs> Krista's uh, always right, I, in my experience. <laughs> Sounds true to me too. Okay, um, Susan says, why did you set the book in Elkins Park? I grew up there. Oh, okay. I set the book in Elkins Park because my best friend at Sarah Lawrence was Erica Goldberg, and she lived in Wincote, Wincote, Jenkintown, kind of right on the line. And uh, I lived too far away to go home for the weekends or Thanksgiving or that sort of thing. So I always went to her family's house and um, it was great because she had two sisters and her parents and I've always stayed very close to all of them and they were very helpful in getting my details straight. You know, I could call Erica and say, wait, where does he go to Catholic school? Where, what basketball league is he on? Where do they go to church? Where, you know, whatever. And she would tell me all those things. It's, it's kind of like tapping my husband for medical details. I just tapped Erica and her family. Okay. Um, so Jean wants to know, <clears throat> can you address the characters in the book, the close brother and sister relationship? Excuse me. <clears throat> can I address the close brother and sister relationship? Yeah, so it's kind of a continuum. I wrote a book called Run also known as RAN, and uh, that's about a bunch of kids who are adopted from different families, and they, they, are, they are together, and what is their relationship, what is their responsibility. And then later on, I wrote a book called Commonwealth, which is about two people who both have families and they marry, and how do the stepchildren interact? And in that book, I became really interested in the relationship between the stepsister and the stepbrother, and then I took that forward. Okay, well, what would it be if it was just a brother and sister novel? Now I do think I have worn out the whole sibling thing. But when people say to me, oh, boy, you are really stuck in a rut. You can't stop talking about siblings. I think, no, I'm exploring all of these different elements and aspects, different kinds of sibling relationships. But yes, now I'm, I'm finished. Um, I, I didn't think they were the same at all, but thank you. Thank you. So Trent says, that is, this is such a wonderful story. Thank you for bringing these authors together for us. So more love for you guys both. And uh, let's see, Robin says, 
Thank you both for being here. Our book club from Montclair, New Jersey is online right now, all five of us. We just finished the Dutch House for our book club and wondered any chance we can get a sneak peek on your next book. Well, yes, again, go to Harper's Magazine, go online, there is no paywall, and you can read the title essay of the book, and then you can go back and the piece in the New Yorker that's also in the book. So that's a, that is a very clear sneak peek into what is going on. Um, and now uh, we have Beth, who's a first time, for, says for the first time novelist. What's the first step a writer should take to transition from completing the first draft to becoming a published novelist? Janine? No, no, I'm looking at Janine. I'm, I'm... I would say complete the second draft. I mean, you don't do anything with the first draft. That's my, I, I, that's the terrible advice because no one wants to hear that, but, um, I think you have to make it the best possible novel it can be before you attempt to submit it anywhere. Um, and often I think that means writing way past where you think it's finished and then like, and then polishing it some more, you know, that's something I'm still learning as well as a writer is that when I think it's good enough, it's, it can still be a lot better, you know, go back and do it again. Yeah, you only get one chance to make a first impression. And so if you are going to send a book to an agent and ask that person to read it, it, it better be the very best thing you're capable of writing. Hopefully you have some friends and you get your friends to read it for you and you take their notes seriously and you go back and you just keep working and working. And if you're lucky, you have some kind of a writing group and you can turn it into a learning experience for everyone. And and then, you know, when it's done, you go on agentfinder.com or whatever, and, and you start sending it to agents. I think writing but, workshops are so crucial. I think if, if uh, that's really great advice to, to get involved in a writing workshop and to trade pages with other people who are doing the same thing and learn from each other, that's a great way to begin. And you don't have to go to an MFA program, you know, like here in Nashville. And I think these places are just popping up everywhere. We have something called the Porch Collective, and it's a bunch of writers who get together and they have writing classes and discussion groups and they workshop and read each other's work, but it's not like you have to sell your house and move away for two years to Iowa. Yeah. Right. Um, so, Robin says, okay, I have a follow-up, and what do you do to decompress? She says, do you go on social media? And we know that the answer to that one is no. What do I do to get depressed? What was the question? Decompress. 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 Oh, okay, decompress. I'm, I was like dropping a syllable in there. What do I do to decompress? Um, I work out. Uh, I just, anything I can do in my house, I was I was made for the pandemic. I mean, there you are never going to find anybody who is as good as sheltering in place as I am. I there are so many things I can do, and I cook, and I again I went to Catholic school for twelve years. I did a great job in home ec. I cook, I clean, I can knit, I can sew, uh, I can I can do yoga DVDs. Uh, there are lots of lots of things I of course read constantly but I am very happy just being at home yeah you are not the first writer who said that to me I have yeah. had a number of writers who I've interviewed um, for the podcast or on here who have said I love the pandemic this is how I live anyway I'm trying so hard not to say that I'm trying really, you know, to not lose sight of the horrors um, and it and the 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 sadness and the burden that everybody is living with. But I got to tell you, I feel like I have spent the last 30 years in an Iron Man suit of my own construction. 
so that I could go out in the world and do what I needed to do. And in the last 10 months, I have taken it off. And I feel, I feel like myself in a way that I haven't felt like myself since I was a kid. Um, I am an introvert. I don't want to go out to dinner. I don't want to present an award. I don't want to stand on a stage. I don't want to go to a party. I don't want to get on a plane. I don't think I ever want to do any of those things again. And I really do wonder how it's going to be when the world opens back up because it's like I've, I have lost my crusty shell and um, I'm, I'm very tender and open and full of love and could just get squashed like that right now. Do you, Janine, do you feel that way? Oh, I think it's been a very different experience for me this year because I, you know, I was supposed to be on tour pretty much the whole year and that um, was upended even before the pandemic. Um, so I've spent a lot of the year sort of recovering <laughs> from that experience. Yeah. But I do think, you know, that, and I have children who are 13 and 10 years old and, and it's a lot right now for them. Um, and we're very, very fortunate um, in our situation, but I think there will be a moment in the future when, I, when we look back at this moment with some kind of nostalgia that we all slowed down and we, yeah. there's something very precious about this bubble of time where we are um, really just so in it together and um, like, I don't think my 13 year old has changed her clothes in three days, you know? So, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there, I, I am trying to find, I'm not an introvert. I like socializing. I am, I, I have the cabin fever. I'm ready to get out of my house. I'm ready to get out of this really protracted moment, um, that has been 2020 and is now leaking into 2021. But, um, but yeah, I I do see and feel the benefits of it as well, for sure. And the good news is you're Ann Patchett. So if you decide you never want to go on tour again, you don't have to. You can stay home. We're going to have to talk about that when the time comes. I, I scheduled my next book to be published the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Like I made that choice myself because no one can send you on book tour at Thanksgiving, it's over. Nobody, tour, you know, Thanksgiving, no one tours through the first of the year. And I thought if I pick this spot when no books are published, yeah. uh, I can just stay home. So smart. I thought so. <laughs> okay, a little more snippet of love from Paula. My book club read The Dutch House and The American Dirt, and American Dirt in September and October. Loved them both. Uh, thank you, Paula. Um, now here's one. Amy wants to know, I never picked up that Maeve may be in a relationship with her boss. Did she? Yeah. Was she? Yep. Yep, she was. No. Mr. Otterson, Maeve, the whole time they were together. But Danny was so oblivious. Danny just it just went right over his head and went over the head of many of my readers too. I think I'm a good reader, but I didn't get that. That's so amazing. Yeah. He, yep. Very canny. Impressed. She was just she was selling frozen vegetables for a reason. She <laughs> loved him. Oh. She was just a super private person. He was in the hospital with her. That's Taking right. Care. Yeah, that's right. He, uh, that's he was with her when she uh, had her heart. Yeah. Well, I don't want to. No spoilers. But yes, they were together. They loved each other. Okay. It's on my mind. All right. So here, this is uh, Dina or Diana. Not sure how to pronounce your name. Sorry if I mispronounce it. Hi, Anne, my favorite author. Do your characters stay with you after you finish their stories? Do they stay with me? Yes. No. Or do they stay with her? They stay no, with you, they... not me. That's the answer. They don't stay with me at all. I give them to you. I put them in a book. I make them up. I put them in a book. 
and then they're yours. And every now and then I'm at a book signing and somebody walks up to me and says, oh, Gen and Roxanne, I never, oh, I love them so much. And I'm thinking, Gen and Roxanne, Gen and Roxanne, who are you talking about? Because I don't remember. So it's almost like you exercise them when you write them down? No, or? it's like I'm a turtle. It's like I'm a turtle and I lay my eggs in the sand and then I just turtle <laughs> crawl away from them. And I never look back to see if they're being eaten by a seagull or if they're turning into happy turtles. It's like, it, yeah, that all goes back to social media. It's just like, don't look back. Don't look back. All right, now this is a follow-up on something that you said. This is another Susan. Why do you think writing nonfiction essays during this time has been such a comfort? I had a lot on my mind. And I just couldn't, I couldn't figure out a novel. I couldn't, mm, I just, I, part of it is just on, on some, level you think well if i'm gonna die i don't want to start something big right you just mm. kind of take it one small thing at a time i know mm. that sounds ridiculous but it is a pandemic and the idea of embarking on a long novel just it it seemed frivolous somehow i couldn't make myself do it hmm wow um. So here's one about the audio version. How did you choose to have Tom Hanks narrate? He did a wonderful job. Um, it's not that I chose to have Tom Hanks narrate so much as uh, Tom Hanks is a friend of mine and I asked him thinking he would never possibly say yes. And he said yes. And how incredibly lucky am I because he did an amazing job. You know, people people will say things like, oh, that was really clever. I mean, that that you offered him the job. And it was like, you know, Tom Hanks doesn't narrate audio books. <laughs> or people will say, did you give him directions? Did you tell him how to read the book? It's like, no, I didn't do that either. I just said, do you want to do this? Oh my God, really? Yes, thank you so much. And that was that was pretty much it. Yeah, a lot of readers have commented to me how much they loved the audio version of it. It's spectacular. And you know, I always say, like, the book is everything I've got. The book is the very best of me, my talent, my intelligence. And then you put the best of everything Tom Hanks has on top of that, and you actually have something twice as good. So it's great. Um this is another one that it reflects, another question that reflects on the conversation we've just had. Do you ever re reuse material that you've thrown out for a different book? For Never. example, turn to Never. those pages about Calcutta. No, no. Janine, do you, have you ever done? No, and I do this thing where I trick myself into thinking that maybe one day I will, and I have a separate document called Cuts, and that's where I dump hundreds of pages. And I'm, and then it makes me feel like I'm not really throwing it out because I'm just recycling it. Maybe one day I will return to this material and I never, ever do, ever. Never. It, what I'll do when I'm going through a book and I'll take out a, a scene that I really love, but I'm not sure that it belongs there, and I put it in the cut file. And then I say, if the next time I read it, I can remember where it was, then I'm allowed to put it back. And I never, I never, ever put it back. Yeah. Um, okay, this, this is uh, from Daniela. And it's a question dear to my heart because, uh, as Anne knows, we both went to Sarah Lawrence. How did your Sarah Lawrence education shape you as a writer and as a woman? Um, oh, I don't know that it did very much for me as a woman, but as a writer, it was really spectacular. And I studied for a year with Alan Gerganis, Grace Paley, and then Russell Banks. I had perhaps the most astonishing undergraduate education in the history of writing. And I have, I just wrote an essay um, that had a lot to do with Alan Gerganis. And I have been in touch with him 
this week a lot. Um, in the New York Times book review, he has the buy the book column this week. So that was very exciting to see him in the paper today. And on Tuesday, the uncollected stories of Alan Gerganis will be published. And it is really a magnificent book. And I want to tell you, because surely we must be coming to the end of this adventure pretty soon. Um, uh, there is a book coming out on Tuesday that you should all read. If you are if you are here watching this, you need to get a copy of George Saunders' A Swim in a Pond in the Rain. And what that is, is George has been teaching at the MFA program at Syracuse University for 20 years, and he has been doing a class on the Russian short story. In this book, there are seven Russian short stories, Chekhov, Tolstoy, Gogol, Turgenev, and then um, his seven lectures about those stories and how they're written. And it just absolutely broke my heart open because I was learning again. It was the most fantastic experience. So if you're just someone who loves to read, or you're someone who loves to write, wants to write, A Swim in a Pond in the Rain by George Saunders, and then The Uncollected Stories of Alan Gerganis, I can't imagine there would be a better writing class you could take than reading those two books. Available, and you know I'm gonna transition right into this now, ready? Okay, available at your local bookstore. So if you are in Montclair, you are shopping at Wachang, and as somebody who owns an independent bookstore, it's really, really important that, and I'm sure you already know this and you're doing it, but support your local bookstores now, have them ship your books to you, pick them up curbside, go into your store. The things that matter to you before the pandemic, you're gonna want them after the pandemic and they're not gonna survive if you aren't there and showing up for them. So I, I beg you to shop local and to support all your local businesses, to pay attention to your local independent bookstores and to take good care of your library. And to remember that seriously, the services that your library provides are services that people need now more than ever. I spent 10 years on my local library foundation board and when people need jobs, they go to the library. And when people need ESL classes, they go to the library. And when people have need camaraderie and book groups, they go to the library. And still, the number one thing people go to the library for, books. Um, so, um, Glennon Doyle Melton, who is no longer Glennon Doyle Melton, excuse me, who is just Glennon Doyle. Glennon Doyle does more unbelievably fantastic charity work than anyone I have ever personally known. And one of the things that she'll do is she'll, she'll focus on something and say, okay, everybody, no one is allowed to send more than $10. That's it, that's a cap. You cannot send more than $10. Because so often we feel like, oh, you know, I only have $10 and so I'm not going to make a contribution because everybody else is going to be sending $100 or $1,000 and my $10 isn't going to make a difference. But Glennon Doyle is such a genius that she knows that you, if you just say $10, then everybody says, well, I can do that. And so that's really what I would urge. This is a free event. Everybody just send 10 bucks to your Montclair library it's going to make such a huge it makes such a huge difference and it just lets you know that you're really really involved in your community don't think that you shouldn't do it because you don't have enough money to make a difference they've provided this lovely free event for you today cough it up there you go okay i i actually i can hardly add anything to that except Thank you so much. And it is our authors who uh, write the books that make the library work. And um, I wanted to say thank you to both of you for coming to Open Mind, Open Book, Open Mind today. And so the Dutch House and Anne's books, all her books, and Janine's books are available for sale at Watchung Booksellers. 
and they're also available to borrow through the library. Um, and finally, we hope that you'll join us for our next two events. And this includes you, Anne and Janine. On Thursday, February 11th at 7 p.m., New York Times op-ed columnist Charles Blow will be talking about his new book, The Devil You Know. And on Monday, February 22nd at 7 p.m., Isabel Wilkerson will be talking about her groundbreaking number one bestseller cast. You can sign up through our website or through the newsletter you'll receive from us in a few days. Be well, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks again. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Janine. Thanks, Ariel. Thank you. Now. Are we done?